all there is is darkness. Then the sound of wind? Or maybe it's waves crashing on the shore. It's hard to tell and we don't get much time to think about it before we snap back to something. Chris appears to have landed in a rather dull and dark looking place. Stony cliffs surrounded by an infinite abyss of shadow. Not a particularly cheery place to wake up after a fall. As Chris slowly picks themselves up, we can see something has changed besides the scenery. Chris appears to have picked up a new wardrobe on the way down here. Jokes aside, this helps to foreshadow that more than just the setting has changed. As we move forward, footsteps echo around us. As we step over to the next room, we see a shining spark of light amid the darkness. It's too interesting to leave alone, so naturally, we step forward to investigate. At times, you see it flickering. The light only you can see. By second nature, you reach out and... Save. We're essentially being taught how saving works, but there's also a few important breadcrumbs being placed. It's being very heavily implied that whoever the narrator is talking to already knows about saving, or at least save points. Whenever the narrator uses the word you, it can be a little ambiguous as to who they're talking about. It oscillates between being directed at the player or at Chris. Watch Andrew Cunningham's narrator analysis for a lot more on that. Here, however, I think it's pretty easy to say that this comment is referring to Chris. We as the player have only just entered this world. We've never seen save points before. Not only that, but on a first playthrough of Deltarune, when we save here, we overwrite an existing game file. In any other game, the file would be empty, and Toby Fox could have done exactly that. Instead, we overwrite a save file that belongs to Chris. As of writing, we have yet to fully see what the implications of this are, but I felt it was important to highlight this scene. Toby Fox has used similar game mechanics for the purposes of storytelling before, so I think we should keep this moment in mind. Moving to the right, music starts to play, setting a very ominous atmosphere. Very similar to the beginning of the game, we're put in a strange and almost alien environment. In the background we see strange... plants? Fungus? Sponges? Whatever they are, they wobble back and forth as we walk past them, almost as if they're waving to us. Up ahead, we see holes in the cliff face. Sludge pours out, almost as if the darkness within has become a liquid. This land feels desolate, disconnected from the bright classrooms up above. It seems almost devoid of life, at first. As we step forward, we see a shadow quickly moving out of our vision. It seems somebody is watching us. There's hardly any dialogue in this segment of the game, but don't think that means I can't overanalyze it anyways. Up until now, this place has seemed very empty, as if we are in a world untouched by any kind of life except for the strange dancing fungus. After seeing that shadow dart out of our vision, we start to get hints that this place may not have always been empty. On the wall, we see a symbol shaped like an eye. We can only see more of these as we continue forward, implying that this isn't an odd natural formation. These symbols indicate that there are other intelligent beings that have been here before. Is the shadow we saw running away one of the people that made the symbols? Or is it what made those people disappear? We also get attacked by some of the dancing fungus. It shoots spores at us, showing that this place doesn't just look dangerous, it is hostile to life. Combine this with the unnatural appearance of these cliffs, and it creates a very post-apocalyptic kind of environment. It conveys the idea that this place was once rather nice, or at least it was nicer than it is now. Wherever we are has been through some sort of decline. Ahead, we find a puzzle, yet another hint of this place's former inhabitants. It instructs us, only eyes blinded by darkness can see the way. While this is a pretty straightforward hint to solve this basic puzzle, I think it may also carry a bit of symbolism. Blindness can be a metaphor for many different things. In this case, I think it could be a metaphor for ignorance. By blinding the eyes, we willingly take on this ignorance in order to go further in this world. Deltarune has themes of escapism, and I believe this is helping to lay some of the groundwork for those ideas. Eyes can also represent an awakening or an awareness. By blinding the eyes, we start the journey off with a lack of awareness. We'll come back to these concepts later, but for now, let's keep moving. Next, we slide down a cliff and land in an area filled with weird piles of dust. They move almost like they're breathing. Suddenly, we see a shadow moving from one dust pile to the next. It almost looks like the same shadowy figure from before, but on a closer inspection we can see that they're different. As we follow them forward, we push aside the dust and see... Susie! Still scared after everything that's happened, she doesn't quite recognize us right away. 
She still tries to mask her fear by threatening us, but quickly settles down. We decide to move forward, though Susie quickly runs off ahead of us. After a little bit, we find a figure looking down at us. They wave from on top a nearby cliff. Before we get much of a chance to have a conversation, they launch an attack. Looks like we were right to be concerned. We are chased around the cliffs, attacked by a barrage of bullets. This serves not only to help raise the tension, but to offer a higher stakes environment for players to learn the core gameplay. As a quick side note, this area is really good at teaching the basic gameplay mechanics to players. It's a very impressive tutorial. After a long slide, we land in a new place. The color palette is different here, indicating that there's been a change of scenery. Something that I'd like to point out real quick is how falling seems to be a common motif in Toby Fox's games. It happens in both chapters of Deltarune and in Undertale as well. Quick note to future viewers, at the time of recording, the rest of Deltarune isn't out yet, so if this ends up being a fluke, then that sucks for me, I guess. Anyways, continuing the video. Maybe it's nothing, but I find it interesting that twice in just the first chapter already, we've watched Chris fall. This could just be a way to indicate how detached we are from the school, but it could also have another meaning. A fall is often used as a way to denote a decline, a period in which the quality of something lowers substantially. Back in part one of this analysis, we pointed out that Chris clearly has a few problems that they're struggling with. This fall could be a way to visually represent that experience. What makes this more interesting is how this affects Susie as well. I think that this might be a very clever way to show that despite their differences on the surface, Chris and Susie have a connection. They've both had very similar experiences that have led them to this place. Continuing onward, we find some walls with candles. Clearly, this place is in much better condition than the cliffs were. Susie waits for us, pointing out a strange castle up ahead. Curious, we venture up towards it. We find ourselves in an empty-looking town square. Taking some time to investigate, we quickly find that it is well and truly abandoned. While this place may look nicer, it still feels as apocalyptic as the cliffs. In fact, it's almost creepier. It's as if you went to Disney World, but no one was there. Speaking of Disney World, to me, this place really does feel like an empty theme park. The buildings are cartoonishly distorted and seem almost flat. Everything is somewhat surreal. It kind of feels like this place is fake. Regardless if it's real or not, the castle definitely feels off. Up ahead, we see the castle. A geyser of darkness bursts forth from it, shooting high into the air. Cautiously, we approach the entrance. Susie and Chris walk forward, and a voice calls out to them. Is it that strange shadow coming back to finish them off? Or maybe somebody new? Moving forward, we see a hooded figure. He tells Chris and Susie that he is the prince of this strange land, and that a prophecy has foretold their arrival. Addressing them as heroes, he asks Chris and Susie if they will hear his tale. We accept and listen to the ancient story. The hooded figure tells us a story of hopes and dreams, of light and dark. This is the legend of Delta Rune. We learn of how light and dark exist in a balance, and if that balance shifts, a terrible calamity will occur. The only ones who can save the world are a human, a monster, and a prince from the dark. They have the power to seal fountains and banish the angels' heaven. This is a very interesting title for such an apocalyptic event. It's not revolutionary to say that angels and heaven are typically seen as good things, yet here we are being told that it is our ultimate goal to banish the angels' heaven. This doesn't necessarily mean that what we are doing is evil or wrong. There are angels in myths and stories that are not purely good. The devil is a fallen angel, there is the angel of death. This angel's heaven may not be a good thing. Regardless of if it's good or evil, this name invokes the idea of a powerful deity, a force well beyond the physical world. Whatever we are fighting against is a very formidable threat. We learn that the geyser in this town is what gives this world form, but another fountain has opened. The balance of light and dark is being threatened. One thing Deltarune does that I find very interesting is how it portrays light and dark. In the overwhelming majority of media, darkness is seen as the personification of evil. Light is good, dark is bad. These early parts of Deltarune fell right into these classic tropes. The cliffs established that this place is dangerous, but now a new idea is being introduced to us. While this world is not a utopia, it's also not completely evil. A reflection of the light, the two worlds exist in a balance. The light and dark are shown as equals. Or at least, that's how things are supposed to be. Clearly the balance is tipping, but I think it's still important to note how having light and dark together is portrayed as a good thing. 
The comparison between light and dark is very important in Deltarune, and I wanted to establish this idea as soon as possible. I'll talk more about this later, but please keep this idea in mind as we continue forward. I know I've been saying that a lot in this video and the previous one, but we're, we're in the beginning of the game. We're establishing a lot. Just, just stick with me here. The hooded figure tells us that they deeply believe Chris and Susie are the heroes of legend, and that they must accept their destiny to save the world. Susie, however, isn't very eager to go along with this. Me? Some kind of hero or something? You've got the wrong person. Of course, it's natural to not want the massive burden of saving the world. Honestly, I can't really blame a teenager for saying no thanks, but look at how Susie phrases this. Notice how she doesn't mention not wanting or being unable to handle the responsibility. She says that she's not a hero. I think this is another very important insight into Susie and how she sees herself. Later, she jokes about the end of the world being fun, but I think this is her trying to mask her insecurity. She has this persona she's created for herself, and after giving us this small look at what she really thinks, she quickly retreats the persona again. Susie starts to walk away, leaving us with the hooded figure. Suddenly, we're interrupted by a new figure. A bike riding maniac flies in and sends the hooded figure soaring off. This new character cheers about how we're already running away and how proud his dad will be. Susie asks, who are you? And this character replies, I'm the bad guy. This is a very interesting line. Not many people self-identify as a bad person outside of cartoon characters and shows for kids. I think it's important that we start asking why this person has chosen to do that. We can't get the answer right now, but trust me when I say it will be a lot more relevant later, so lock this line in your memory for now. I think that there's also an interesting comparison between this character and Susie being established almost immediately. As I mentioned before, Susie embraces an aggressive persona because she thinks that everyone will see her as a bully anyways. This character also willingly calls themselves a bad guy. We don't know why, but this is something we should take note of. This bad guy lets us know a little bit more about the dark fountain we are apparently trying to seal. Susie denies this as her goal, but we quickly learn that regardless of what we want, the only way back home is to head to the fountain. Seems like we've had our freedom taken from us yet again. This character introduces himself as a Lancer, and I can finally stop finding ways to address him while avoiding using his name. Lancer then reveals his plan to thrash our heroes, but Susie and Chris decide to put a stop to that, thus engaging our first battle. This segment here is really abrupt and chaotic, throwing a lot of information at the player all at once. Honestly, I have to be upfront and say that this is a bit of a flaw for the game. From a story perspective, this makes sense, but for actually teaching players mechanics, it's a bit too much. I don't think that's a revolutionary critique, but it's something I always think of when I replay the game. Small complaints aside, we manage to survive Lancer's attacks. Thankfully, his bike runs out of fuel. He takes off while vowing to return to finish this fight later. The hooded figure returns, somehow unharmed after being launched into the stratosphere. They offer to introduce themselves properly, but seem a bit nervous. Maybe it's because of Lancer's attack, or maybe there's something more going on here. Susie asks them to take off their hood, and we get a look at who this figure is. He introduces himself as Ralsei and expresses how happy he is to meet the two of us. Susie doesn't seem to care very much, and simply asks where to go before taking off. Ralsei awkwardly approaches us and continues his introduction. He tells us he's a prince, but has no subjects, and he's been waiting his whole life for us. Wow, that is a lot for this sweet fluffy boy to go through. He seems very happy, but his loneliness is very clear. He tries to be almost overly friendly, seemingly a bit desperate for us to be friends with him. Of course, this makes sense given what we know about his backstory so far. We can start to pick up on a few key details about Ralsei already. The way he chose to present himself, hidden behind a hood, shows us a little about his character. It might indicate that he's concerned about how people perceive him. Just look at the way he speaks when first meeting Chris and Susie. He gives a grand and verbose speech, like an ancient wizard from a fairy tale. When met with something unexpected, however, he doesn't know how to react. Lancer arriving and Susie leaving both seem to throw him off his script. From there, he suggests going to look for Susie. He tells Chris that they can lead the way, which, while a seemingly innocuous statement, I think actually highlights another important part of his character. When playing games, it's sort of natural for us to assume the role of a leader. In this case, it's a little strange for us to take the lead. Ralsei presumably knows more about this place than we do. Why would he tell Chris to lead the way? We don't really have enough information to come to a conclusion here, but I'd like you to take note of how Ralsei elevates Chris above himself. 
This won't be the last time it happens. As we move down further, Ralsei starts giving us a few tutorials. Pretty standard stuff before we move to the main game. That doesn't mean we're done here though. There's a few interesting tidbits we can pick up in this segment. When teaching us how to sprint, Ralsei explains it cheerily until mentioning that if we want to leave him behind, he's still gonna follow us. Unless you want to get away, in which case, sorry. I think this helps to further build up Ralsei's personality. Wanting to stick strongly to his goals, but also not wanting to impose on Chris. We saw this with him letting Chris lead the way before, but this is an interesting example of where those two parts of Ralsei come into conflict. He wants to fulfill his duty as a hero, but he also seems to want to let Chris take control. A very interesting idea when taking into account the themes of freedom. Moving forward, we get a more proper introduction to combat. It's pretty standard, but there are a few interesting statements here. Ralsei points out the heart and gives us some more information about it. See that heart, Chris? That's your soul, the culmination of your very being. Within it holds your will, your compassion, and the fate of the world. At the very beginning of the game, we were introduced to this heart, and it clearly was very important, but it seemed like it had a different role. It seemed as though the soul was creating or maintaining a connection of some kind. It was summoned here for some kind of purpose. Combining this with what we just learned, it implies that whatever events are unfolding have been intentionally put into motion. Perhaps the voice from the beginning was trying to save the world as well? Regardless, this creates a connection between Ralsei and the person at the beginning of the game. Both have knowledge about the soul, which, as we'll see later, is a pretty rare thing. In another moment that's important for understanding Ralsei, he discourages us from fighting. He still teaches us how to do it, and is willing to fight with us, but he does imply that avoiding violence would be best for everyone. It's odd how he doesn't try very hard to convince Chris. It seems more like a suggestion than a warning. He also mentions that it seems like Chris is experienced at fighting. That seems like a pretty big Chekhov's gun, but we'll have to wait and see. After more learning and a cute scene of hugging the fluffy boy, we move on ahead to the great door. There, Ralsei once again emphasizes that we should avoid fighting. Now he's a little bit more vocal on the subject, warning us that we may not like the end if we choose to fight. Ultimately, there's still the implication that Chris's choices are more important than settling things peacefully. I don't think I need to say it again, but I will. Before hopping into the main part of the story, Deltarune is hammering home this theme of choice and freedom. The game shifts its focus away from that a little bit in the next segment, but I think it's not a mistake that the game is harping on the idea of how important Chris's choices are three times back to back before moving forward. This is also important to Ralsei, who acts like most NPCs in games do. He gives the player a tremendous amount of importance and control over the world. What the player wants is what's most important, even if it might not be what other people want. With that, we're ready to move on beyond the great door and see what lies ahead of us in this strange new world.